Hey everyone, how's it going? I want to do a book talk today, and this is my first book talk in some time. And I want to talk about a really interesting uh, little novel by William Faulkner. I'm going to talk about As I Lay Dying, a, a novel that was published in uh, 1930. And uh, this novel is an example of the Southern Gothic genre, and it's the first Southern Gothic novel that I've ever read. I have read To Kill a Mockingbird, which I think has, like, some small elements of a Southern Gothic novel, but isn't, like, a proper Southern Gothic novel. But other than that, I have not read any Southern Gothic uh, fiction, and this was certainly quite an introduction to the genre, I have to say. Uh, so, what this book is about is about the Bundren family, uh, who live in uh, Mississippi, and uh, th this takes place probably right around the time when it was published in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, and the Bundren family uh, have re recently experienced a bereavement. The mother, Addie, has just died. She She is still alive briefly at the very beginning of the novel, but then she quickly dies. We don't really hear very much from her from her at that point. And what the shtick that Addie had was that she really wanted to be buried in a Jefferson, Mississippi uh, when she died, which is obviously not where the family currently lives. And this, the story of this novel, the impetus for the action is that her husband and her children all try to, you know, put her in a coffin and get her to Jefferson with some degree of difficulty. Uh, you know, this is not a, uh, a, a very, a very safe journey to Jefferson. You know, I would never would have thought that it would be this difficult to get from one town in the south to another, but so it is, you know, they have a really hard time crossing this one river and someone nearly dies, uh, some animals do die, uh, some donkey, some donkeys that they were having pull, or mules, I think, uh, and it's a really arduous journey getting her body to, uh, Jackson, Missis or Jefferson, Mississippi. And so the main characters in this novel, the ones who we hear from the most, are the family, the Bundrens, so we have ants, who is uh, Addie's husband, so the father of the family. He is uh, kind of a lazy man. He has never really wanted to work in his life. He's sort of left all the work up to his sons and children and other people in his life. He's incredibly lazy, kind of a kind of a, a freeloader, we might say. Uh, so, not a very likable guy. Uh, Cash is the oldest son, and he's kind of stoic and quiet, kind of like your uh, typical sort of masculine man, I suppose. Uh, Darl is the second oldest son, and he is kind of the intellect. He's kind of the most eloquent of all of the Bundrens. You know, I was reading on the Wikipedia page for this novel that well, was one of the first first-person narrators who had a you know, a facility for language that we wouldn't expect the character himself to actually have based on his background, his education. These are mostly, you know, poor, um, uneducated people. And yet Darl writes with a lot of eloquence that we would not expect from someone from that background. And so he is kind of sort of almost an omniscient narrator. I think he, you can see him a little bit like uh, Ishmael in Moby Dick. Uh, Ishmael is also a first person narrator, but he frequently seems to have omniscient insight into what's going on around him. You know, he, he seems to be privy to events that he couldn't have actually been privy to, and that seems to be true of Darl as well. So he is the he is the character with the most number of chapters from his perspective, and I should say here, every chapter is a first-person narrative. So each chapter is from the perspective of a different character, but it's always a first-person sort of almost monologue. Um, and so we do get multiple chapters from different perspectives. As I said, we have the most chapters from Darl. Uh, but yeah, we, we get chapters from all of the Bundrens, uh, and then several of the people that they meet along the way. Uh, and, and that's sort of the structure of the novel. Um, but anyway, to continue with my rundown of the major characters, uh, Jewel is the next uh, son in the family. And he is he, 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 he and the youngest son, Vardaman, uh, are the two who seem to be genuinely affected by the death of Addy. Most of the other family members are, at best, ambivalent, and at worst, they just kind of don't care, or even are kind of happy to have Addy gone. Uh, because what you learn, with, the, with something, something you gather over the course of this novel, is that Addy was not a particularly uh, affectionate or loving mother, and, and Ants has not been a particularly good father either. Uh, and the only child of all of the children it, to really love her is Jewel, and possibly Vardaman, although that might just be because of his age. Uh, but Jewel was also the only son that Addie showed a lot of affection for, uh, and so we kind of see that 
uh, that dynamic throughout the, build throughout this novel. And then the last of the major characters from whom we get a lot of chapters is named Dewey Dell. She is uh, the only girl among the children of the Bundrins. Uh, she's around 17 years old, so she's uh, the second youngest, but she's still uh, eight years older than Vardaman. And uh, she is an extremely tragic character. She uh, is pregnant by this man who she has been in a relationship for a time. And we see her at a couple of points throughout the novel try to get an abortion and not really succeed. Uh, so she's just this very, you know, quiet, melancholic, tragic character. But she's also kind of the most um, affectionate character. You know, we do see her really try to take care of, especially Vardaman, but also the other brothers. You know, you almost get, the, I almost get the sense throughout the novel that Dewey Dell is, is sort of the surrogate mother for a lot of these other men. Maybe not so much for ants, but for, for the other men who are her brothers, she seems to be a surrogate mother, which is ironic because she's younger than them. You know, you, you know, I don't think that the younger sister should have to be like the surrogate mother of her older brothers, but she does seem to occupy, at times, almost a mother position, especially to Cash when he gets injured. Cash, at one point, uh, breaks his leg and, you know, is being carried along, actually, on top of the coffin that Aunt Addie is inside of, uh, and, and Dewey really seems to take care of him a little bit as well. Uh, so those are the ma major characters. I can't go into all of the characters because there's, there's chapters from the perspective of a lot of different characters. And like I said, they're all in this sort of first-person monologue. And what I find really interesting about that aspect of this novel is that it reminds me actually a lot of the films of Terrence Malick. Uh, so if anyone, if you're not familiar with the, fil the films of Terrence Malick, uh, they, they tend to feature a lot of voiceover. And so you'll be seeing what a character is doing throughout the film, and you'll hear their sort of internal monologue, and sort of often in sort of whispers, almost. And they'll be talking about their feelings, about what's going on, their thoughts. Uh, you know, the, the narration in Terrence Malick films is not for exposition and explaining things to you like it is in a lot of Hollywood movies. It's for introspection and kind of character insights. And uh, that seems to be sort of influenced by the style of this novel, perhaps. Uh, and Terrence Malick, a lot of his films do take place um, out west and sort of in the south, and a lot of his characters are from the south. So it stands to reason, and Terrence Malick himself is from Texas. So it stands to reason that that he would be influenced influenced by by Faulkner. Uh, and, and so I, I don't want to go uh, too much into that because obviously this video is not about Terrence Malick. Uh, but so th this novel, one of the things that I think is difficult about this novel is that a lot goes unsaid. You know, a lot is implied or suggested or conveyed through euphemism. Uh, and you know, it's one of those novels that is not so much dense in terms of understanding the text. I think that the text itself in this novel is quite easy to get. I mean, if you might may occasionally have a little bit of a difficulty with the sort of dialect it's written in at times. It's not written in a heavy dialect, but it is written with a sort of southern twang almost, or a southern drawl. I don't know how you can convey a southern drawl in writing, but it seems like Faulkner almost man manages that. But that's not a big barrier. What's the big barrier in this novel, I think, to understanding it is the white space, is everything that goes unsaid. And I I personally don't pretend to have all that figured out. I don't know what's all there in the white space. But, you know, you, you, you have to really read this novel vigilantly to get a sense of the dynamic between all the characters. And I think if you do read it attentively, you do get a sense of this family dynamic. Uh, and I've tried to sort of speak to what I've been able to glean from my own reading of the novel. Uh, but, you know, right from uh, the title of the novel, we have a lot of uh, classical and uh, biblical references in this book. Uh, so, As I Lay Dying is taken from uh, the Odyssey of Homer, and it's from a, the scene in which uh, Odysseus goes into the underworld and talks to Agamemnon, and Agamemnon is telling him about when his wife Clytemnestra murdered him. And he, so he's talking about the moment when he died, you know, that that's what it's referring to. And uh, and that's an interesting point of reference because it also invites a reference to the Oresteia by Aeschylus. And so the Oresteia, in the Oresteia, the Oresteia tells the story of Clytemnestra killing Agamemnon, and the reason that she kills him is because she's angry with him for having killed their daughter. Uh, he actually sacrificed their daughter in order to get favorable winds to carry the the, uh, the Achaean fleet to Troy, to destroy Troy. Uh, and 
you know, you can see a parallel in that and Ants, in the sense that Ants has never wanted to work in his life, and has made his children do all the work. So you can see maybe that as a metaphorical, you know, sacrifice of his own children, and perhaps uh, that is, uh, sug that suggests th a tumultuous relationship between Addie and, and, and Ant Ants. Uh, but, you know, the Oresteia is also a story of, you know, a cycle of, of blood feuds and revenge. Uh, because, of course, when Clytemnestra kills Agamemnon, Agamemnon's son, Orestes, is then obligated to take revenge on Clytemnestra. But in order to take revenge on Clytemnestra, he has to invoke another blood debt by taking revenge on another person. But also, he has to become a kinslayer. He has to kill his own mother. And so, this seems perhaps to suggest uh, an indirect... Uh, 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 indirectly, it seems to suggest this theme of, uh, you know, generational trauma. You know, this idea that trauma can be passed through the generations, from the parent to the child to the grandchild, just, you know, through parenting styles and upbringing and so on and so forth. And it seems to suggest that, and that's an incredibly uh, tragic background. But, you know, a lot of the cadences in the writing in this book are reminiscent of the Old Testament, certainly. certainly. Uh, there, there are points in it that sound very uh, McCarthyan to me, by which I mean Cormac McCarthy, who of course was very influenced by Faulkner as well. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're, they're these points that get very poetic and, yeah, Old Testament style kind of, uh, yeah, d d d eloquence and so on. Uh, and, and those are gen generally fleeting. They come for a few sentences and then disappear. Uh, and Cormac McCarthy, it seems, took those those elements from the writing of William Faulkner and just blew them up into his own, his whole style, right? Uh, but again, I don't want this to be a video about Cormac McCarthy, because this is a video about as they lay dying. We see the influence of Nietzsche as well, I think, in this, and I'll get to, the, to that in a minute. And Hamlet as well, uh, and I will again get to that in a second. Uh, but also I think we see uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich uh, by Leo Tolstoy, which I think is sort of to a certain degree about, you know, redemption through suffering. You know, Ivan Ilyich in that story is not a particularly nice person, is, you know, kind of nasty, but we end up sympathizing with him, and it's suggested in that story that he gains some sort of redemption through the suffering that he goes through during his dying days. Um, but in this story, I think that that's inverted in the sense that there really is no redemption, or at least if there is a small glimmer of light here, it's so small that it's difficult to see this as at all a hopeful story, whereas the death of, I death of Ivan Ilyich was, I think, a hopeful story. Because, you know, you could see perhaps this carrying of the, of the, of the coffin to Jefferson uh, as a way of gaining redemption through suffering, because it's a very difficult journey, right? Of course, I've already mentioned uh, one person breaks their leg along the way, uh, they, they almost, some people almost drown, uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and the, the, yeah, and I won't go into detail because I don't want to spoil everything, but there is no redemption, you know, this family is still screwed up at the end of the story, you know, uh, yeah, I, I can't go into too much more detail because I, again, I don't want to spoil too much, but, you know, at every turn in this novel, uh, everything, every idea, every safeguard that human beings have relied on is subverted, and made to seem empty. So, you know, uh, the the only pastor we meet in this story is a hypocrite, is a moral hypocrite, and also uh, slept with another man's wife, which is not a particularly pastorly thing to do. Uh, the father, of course, is lazy, so he's not being a father in the way that traditionally fathers were expected to be, you know, they were expected to take care of the family, and he did not do that. Uh, the mother is unloving. Again, we have this idea in our society of mothers as loving and nurturing, and Addie was not loving and nurturing. Uh, the pallbearers, so in a certain sense, this family are pallbearers for Addie Bundren, all seem to hate each other, you know? We think of, again, pallbearing as this very solemn duty that you do as a communal thing with these other people who loved the person that they're burying, but in this instance, it, you know, everyone can't seem to stand each other, except for maybe Dewey Dell and, and Vardaman, and, and there, there are some flashes of connection between these this family, but largely they seem to not get along with each other, especially Jewel and Ants. There's a lot of animosity between them, uh, and I don't want to go into why, because again, I don't want to get uh, too, too, uh, too spoilery here, but I want to end on a, a note, a, a certain, I want to end with a quote. And the quote goes to what I think is a 
huge influence of Nietzsche and Hamlet in this book. Um, and, uh, and the quote is this, uh, and it's from Twilight of the Idols, Idols if you're curi curious. That for which we find words is already dead in our hearts. There is always a kind of contempt in the act of speaking. So whenever we have words for something, and it's ironic that I'm saying this now after having spoken for like 15 minutes on this book, uh, whenever we have words for something, uh, we show that we really don't know it. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind when you're watching this video about As I Lay Dying, I suppose, which is sort of a, a difficult novel to wrap your head around. Uh, but, you know, you, there's this one pivotal chapter, and I don't want to say what it is, because again, I don't want to spoil too much, because there's a lot in this book that I think is good to experience for yourself without having spoiled. Uh, there's one pivotal chapter in which this idea, I think, is driven home like crazy. This idea that words are empty, and therefore ideas are empty, you know, motherhood, fatherhood, religion, uh, language, morality, all of them are suspect, because they're all just words. You know, this idea in this novel that the only thing that's meaningful is actions. And if you've acted out a certain sentence in real life, then you don't need to put it into words anymore. And if you're putting it into words, then you haven't acted it out, and therefore you don't actually know it. Um, and there's this paradox at the, at the heart of that, you know, because obviously we rely on words, but words are, are unreliable. And, uh, yeah, this, and, and the reason that that connects to Hamlet is because, uh, you know, Harold Bloom at least believes that, uh, or believed, uh, the late Harold Bloom believed that, that Hamlet was subscribed to this idea that words are something dead in our hearts, that there's a contempt in the act of speaking, which is ironic because Hamlet of two, of course, goes on speaking and speaking and speaking throughout Hamlet until he dies. Uh, and yeah, so anyway, there, there, there is a lot in here and, you know, it seems like it's just a really powerful sort of testament to this idea of existential nihilism, you know, that everything is empty and there is no meaning and even any meaning that we might try to make is itself meaningless and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so anyway, I will, I will leave it at that. I, I hope you got something out of this video. I certainly enjoyed making it and anyway, I will, I will leave it at that and I will talk to you all later and give me your thoughts on the book if you have them, of course. Uh, but anyway, I will leave it at that. Bye now.